Amen. All right. Uh, how many of you, uh, well, this is, this is a part two of a series that I'm doing called The Trinity on Trial, an in-depth look at the nature of God or the Godhead. How many remember the first one that I did? Uh, we went through the Targumim and all of that, right? Okay, I'm going to do a quick review for those of you that weren't so that you can be on the same page as me, and then we will quickly move into the subject matter of the night, which is, is Jesus God? Is Yeshua Yahweh? Let's go through it. Number one, uh, we talked about the angel of the Lord. Exodus 23, 20 says, Behold, I sent an angel before you to keep you in the way and bring you into the place which you, I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Do not provoke him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if you indeed obey his voice, do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. And by the way, you can by default, because it says that if you do not obey him, he will not pardon your transgressions. Uh, the reciprocation of that is also true, the reciprocal of that, that if you do obey him, he will pardon your transgressions. And so there's an authority given to the angel that interestingly he has the right to forgive or not forgive. Let's move forward. The angel of God. So now we, the angel was dispatched, take him out of the Exodus. The angel of God or the angel of Elohim in Hebrew spoke to me in a dream saying, Jacob. And I said, here I am. And he said, now listen, the angel of God spoke to him in a dream. So remember, the angel of God is the one speaking. He says, here I am. And he said, lift up your eyes now and see all the rams which leap on the flocks are streaked, speckled, and gray spotted. We just went through this. For I have seen all the Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel. Now the angel is speaking, and now the angel says, I am the Elohim of Bethel. Do you know what Bethel means? It's made of two Hebrew words, Bet and El, the house of God. I am the Elohim of the house of God, where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land, and return to the land of your family. So how many can recognize there that don't need a PhD that we've got a problem on our hands? Because it says that the angel of God is speaking, and the angel instantaneously turns around and calls himself the Elohim of of Israel, the Elohim of the house of God. And he even goes beyond that and says that you made a vow to me. Genesis 48, 15. And he blessed Joseph and said, God, uh, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all of my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Jacob is blessing Ephraim and Manasseh. And the whole hand crossing, the whole thing. And it says that God is doing this. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Thank you. Tada. And he said, the angel has redeemed me from evil. Now, I don't know about you, but angels have no ability to redeem. This is a big problem, by the way. Uh, how many know Gnosticism, Jewish Gnosticism of the first century? This is one of the problems of the Gnostics. You find this in Colossians chapter 2. It's a dead giveaway who's talking because... The, the, the end of chapter 2 gives away they're worshiping angels. Where do you think they got the idea from? The only thing they had was the Tanakh at the time. And so you've got this concept of this angel of the Lord or this angel of Yahweh, but there is a, trans, uh, there is a transference of identity between the angel and Yahweh himself. Exodus chapter 3, verse 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire. Get this, from the midst of the bush. We talked about this. So the, the, the bush is burning. It's Moses' experience. And it's the angel of the Lord that's in the middle of the bush. And it says, So when the Lord saw that, when Yahweh saw that he turned aside and looked, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses. So the angel of the Lord is the one that's in the midst of the bush that appears to, to Moses. But it's God that speaks. So we only have one of two choices. Either the angel of the Lord is God, or there is an angel and God both in the middle of the bush, and they're swapping names whenever they want. You laugh. But that's exactly what's happening. Then we went into the Targumim. We went into the Aramaic translations of the Hebrew. 
And in first temple time, or second temple times, during the time of Yeshua, in the synagogues, they would read it from the Hebrew Torah, and then they would read from the Targums, okay? Like the Targums of Jonathan, uh, of the Ankylos. They would read from the Aramaic version, because that was the language of the day, the very common spoken language of the day. And it was most understood, more understood. Same thing today. Most people, most Jews do not know Hebrew. And so they do the, the, uh, the services in Hebrew, but they'll also do some in English so people can understand. Same exact thing. So here's what it is. This was the Hebrew. I'm going to read you the Hebrew. And then the Targum, the Aramaic translation. So you can see what their perspective was, what they thought these verses meant. Genesis 28 and 20. We just read this, uh, or this week's Torah portion. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me, then the Lord shall be my God. But then in the Targums, it says this. This is Jewish, guys. This isn't people messing with this. This is their text. If the word of the Lord will be my helper, the Lord shall be my God. They changed it. There was an understanding that it was the word that was doing all these things. Let's check it out and see if that's just an isolated incident. Exodus 14, 31, the Hebrew says, and they believed in the Lord, but the Aramaic says, and they believed in the word or the memra of the Lord. Exodus 20, verse 1, the Hebrew says, and the Lord spoke all these words, but the Aramaic says, and the word of the Lord spoke all these words. Time out, we have a literary problem. Words don't speak. So it's one thing to say God spoke these things, but it's another thing, that say, another thing to say, and the word of the Lord spoke these things. That's personification is what that word is. It's personifying the word, quote unquote, like a rock. The rock said. That doesn't make sense. It also doesn't make sense to say the word said. No, somebody had to say a word, but a word itself doesn't speak. It doesn't have that ability or does it? And so the point of we went through this for an hour is to show that in the mind of the Jewish believer or the Jew at the time, Believer or unbeliever, it doesn't matter. In their mind, most of the work that was done in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, dealing with the people of God, was done by the Word. That's why they interchanged it. And they did personify it. This was not, uh, and I'm going to show that to you a little bit later. So the memra of God, check this out, according to the Targums in Aramaic, the memra of God, the word of God is found walking in the garden, delivering his people from Egypt, administering covenants, speaking on God's behalf, gives commandments, is the helper, it's called the helper, and is called the shield. The word is called all of these things. So you're a first century Jew, you don't believe in Yeshua, maybe you never heard of him, but every week you're going to Shabbat, service like you are today and they're reading from the Torah and week in and week out year in and year out they're hearing the word of the Lord is doing these things and by the way have you ever thought and I mentioned this two weeks ago but have you ever even stopped to think that the word of God is actually walking in the garden God has legs apparently in Genesis because they heard him walking in the garden. So he wasn't just like floating around on a hovercraft. He was walking. Means he had legs. First time in, the, in your Bibles that God is actually flesh. No way to get around it. You can say it's a spirit. But spirit must have had legs because it made noise. The word, no question about it, in the mind of the Jew, not the Christians, didn't exist yet, haven't gotten there yet. In the mind of a Jew, the word of God was Yahweh. Jeremiah 1.11 will prove it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, you can look this up, it's in your own Bibles, I think this is New King James. The word of the Lord came to me saying, so the word came to Jeremiah saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, Adonai. Adonai is only used for deity, the supreme deity Yahweh. Then Adonai said to me, you have seen well, for I am ready to perform my word. So the word is equal to Adonai, according to Jeremiah. And this is a very well-known concept in Judaism. It's not a well-known concept in Christianity or even in Messianic Judaism today or Hebrew roots. 
For those that are in Hebrew roots, they, this is totally foreign to most of them. This concept that the Judaism actually believed. There were sects of Judaism that fully believed in what I'm about to show you, which is going to be, I think, really amazing. The concept of a plurality within the Godhead. Don't turn off your television yet. Be open-minded. You don't know everything, right? Neither do I. But let's begin. Who rides on the clouds? Who rides on the clouds? Behold, He comes, right? Riding on the clouds. Shining like the sun. Let the trumpet call, right? Paul Wilbur made that song famous. Now you all just want me to keep going, right? Amen. Are you sure? Psalm 68, 33 says, To him who rides on the heavens of heavens, which is clouds in Hebrew, which were of old, indeed he sends out his voice, a mighty voice. Isaiah 19, 1, The burden against Egypt, behold, Adonai rides on a swift cloud and will come into Egypt. Psalms 104, 3 says, He lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters, who makes the clouds his chariot, who walks on the wings of the wind. And Deuteronomy 33, 26 says this, There is no one like the God of Jeshurun, Jerusalem, who rides on the heavens to help you, and in his excellency on the clouds. Now, before you say, well, that doesn't mean a whole lot to me, you need to know something that is absolutely critical to understanding these passages. Would it be interesting to you to learn that in paganism and in Egyptian uh, theology, that this phrase was an idiom? This was a well-known idiomatic expression before this was penned for the sun god. It was the sun god who was said to ride on the clouds. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, he's up there with a little harp and he's just like hanging out on the clouds, riding on the clouds, you know. No, it was an idiomatic expression, expre expression that meant that he ruled the heavens. This is why sometimes you will see him who rides on the heaven of heavens, and sometimes you'll hear it say the same exact word interpreted, riding on the clouds. It is an idiomatic expression that says he is the king and ruler of all of the heavens. Does that make sense? So it's awesome to me to watch the Scriptures being penned and they're saying, oh, no, 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 by the way, you pagans, when you read this, understand that it is our King who rides the clouds. It is Yahweh, the God of Jeshurun. It is the God of Jerusalem, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who is riding swiftly and is in His excellency ruling the heavens. It did not just mean that you get on your little horse and you're riding on the clouds. And anybody could do so. No one could do so except the supreme being. This is why that phrase is used only for Baal. It is only used for Zeus. In whatever uh, culture it was, the sun god was called something different. It was only that head supreme sun god deity that was the riding on the clouds it would not dare ever allow anyone else to take that position so i asked you a question earlier i said who rides on the clouds and you said yeshua why because you read the back of the book but if what if you didn't have the back of the book what if you're a new testament believer and there's no new testament 2000 years ago and the only thing you have is the scriptures the tanakh the saints, the prophets, and the Torah. And what it says is the one who rides on the clouds is Yahweh Himself. Every Jew knew this. This is not new information to them if they know their Bible. So if they're a rabbi of rabbis, the Apostle Paul, Paul knows this because he grew up under Gamaliel. Just to sit under Gamaliel, you had to have Torah memorized word for word. Most of us can't memorize our address word for word. Or your social security number. But he's got the entire thing memorized word for word. Do you not think that this is reverberating in his mind? Who rides on the clouds? Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 says, Behold, 
He, Yeshua, is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see Him, even those who pierced Him, and the tribes of earth will mourn because of Him. Even so, amen. You draw whatever conclusion that you want to make from that, but there is a idiomatic expression that meant one who rules the heavens, and it is directly attached, attached to the Son of the living God coming at the end of time to judge His people. But that scripture alone, let's not rely on. Matthew 24, 30, let's add to it. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Only descriptions, adjectives, and titles given to Adonai Elohim of the Old Testament. This is why we had big problems in the first century. When Yeshua's walking along, when the disciples are trying to explain who He is, and Yeshua's making verbiage, because He's saying things, ladies and gentlemen, and He's quoting the Scriptures. This is the Scripture that He quotes. They want to stone Him. Because they know exactly what He's saying. Matthew 26, 62, And the high priest arose and said to Him, Do you answer nothing? So He's being, this is His trial. What is these men What is it? These men testify against you. But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living Elohim, by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Yeshua said unto him, It is as you said, nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now, folks, you're Jewish. You're the high priest. Let's hope the high priest went to Saturday school and learned that the riding on the... You'll get that on the way home. That that riding on the clouds was something set aside for the supreme God of Israel. Which should make a little bit of sense with their response. What was their response? Crucify Him. This man is making himself out to be God. Why? Because he said that you're going to see me, the Son of Man, sitting at the right-hand power of God. That was not the problem. Sitting at the right-hand power of God is not the problem. How do do I know that? Because it's messianic. They expected the Messiah to be at the right-hand power of God. That Yahweh would use the Messiah as his power, his strength, the yod in the first letter of his name. Riding on the clouds? Brother, nobody sits in that chariot except for Pharaoh on earth, and no one sits in that chariot in heaven except for Yahweh. That's why they had a big fit and tore their clothes. Watch this, Ancient of Days. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow. And the hair of his head was like wool. His throne was a fiery flame and its wheels burning fire. We don't even comprehend what he's looking at. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Nadab and Abihu understand what that was all about. And thousands upon thousands, the Hebrew actually means thousands times thousands. And, and really what it means literally in the Greek mind, we would just say, oh, wow, let's see how many angels there are. 1,000 times 1,000. No, it's infinite times infinite. It means uncountable times uncountable. Minister to him, 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. Compare this with Revelation chapter 5 and following in verse 11. It says, Then I looked, John is in the Lord, in, on the Lord's day, a vision happens, and I heard a voice of many angels around the throne. Same exact vision. The living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, comma, 
I heard say, blessing and honor, glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Stop. This scripture is significant for two reasons. Number one, it is saying that, first of all, he is going through the vision that Daniel had, and he is saying that there are tens of thousands, same exact moment, before the thrones of God. And the glory, blessing, and honor, and glory, and power is given to the one that sits on the throne and to the Lamb. It's equal blessing, equal glory, equal honor, and equal power is given to the Lamb. I've got a problem with that if I'm a first century Jew. Why? Because I know the Torah, and I know the prophets, and it says that God will never share His glory with another. I know that scripture. So as a Jewish person, if I read the apocalyptic writings of John, I have a major issue with this because the glory is being shared with the Lamb of God. That can't happen. Or can it? That's what we're going to discover tonight. I'm not making conclusions yet. I'm just, I'm, we're going through evidences so that you can see some things. So let's finish this out. Then the four living creatures around the throne said this, Amen, that is the truth, is what it means. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped Him who lives forever and ever. Wait a minute, time out. We know for a fact this is not the word for honor. In the Greek, unfortunately, we don't see this. There can be the word worship and it can actually mean the word honor. Like I would honor the President of the United States, or maybe that's a bad example, uh, but I, maybe I would honor a dignitary, but I would, I would honor the, the presidency if he came in here. I would honor him in his role. I have to like what he does, right? But it says to honor those that are in authority. But this is not that word. We know this because they're prostrating. That's what the word worship, shock, mean in Hebrew, it's what it means. It means uh, to prostrate yourself before the Most High God, to worship. Only, you only shock, you only worship Yahweh Himself. How do we know this? Because there's another time where He tries to worship the angel, and He falls and bows before the angel, and, the, and an angel says, no, 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 you don't understand that. I'm just like you. I'm a servant of the Most High God. Do not bow before me. The only time in Scripture that that Worship is allowed, or bending, or bowing, prostrating before a, a creature is allowed, as if it's God Himself. And so we know, and of course that makes sense, some of you go, where are you going with this? The four living creatures would clearly fall and worship the one who lives forever. And it would certainly seem that it's talking about Yahweh. But the problem is, is that the context of this chapter is about Yeshua. What does it say that? Let's go back. It says in verse 12, saying with a loud voice, worthy is a lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing because he lives. If you read the rest of the chapter, you see that he lives. It says over and over, he's lived and he's alive forevermore. And it repeats it in verse 14, and the creatures fell and worshiped before the lamb who is, lives forever and ever. Unless you think that I'm stretching things, let's dig deeper. That was first base. You may agree, you may disagree, it's okay. We're after the truth. There's a lot of people that would say this, especially people that, that uh, maybe they're new, and they, they're just learning uh, about the, the, the Christian roots of their faith, and they come out of, of the traditional denominational background that they come from, and they begin to throw the baby out with the bathwater because they get upset. And we're emotional creatures. Can we just admit that? We get mad when somebody cuts us off on the highway. We don't know why we got mad. We're just mad. It didn't slow us down. We're just mad they cut us off. We're emotional creatures, and we do things out of emotional habit. We make decisions based on our gut. Most of the time, it's not out of logic. It's completely out of emotion. 
So when we come into understanding some of these things, we look back at our past and we literally throw everything out and say, it must not be true. And here's why, because we love uh, the first century uh, Jew, we love the Hebrew, we love the Hebraic line of thinking, and Hebrews would never believe that there could be two Yahwehs because of the Shema. Here always is the Lord our God is one. The Jew of the first century would never believe that there is such thing that the Messiah could actually be God himself. I used to believe that. In my ignorance and lack of, t- of, of, of study, I used to believe that. That's like saying every Christian believes that you shouldn't dance. If they meet one denomination, and you're an alien from outer space, and that denomination believes that you shouldn't dance or you shouldn't even have music, they're going to walk away, and their impression is all Christians believe that you can't have music and you can't dance. Do you follow my line of reasoning? So because of our 2,000 years removed from Judaism of the first century and the 26 sects that 26 sects are groups of, of Judaism that existed, we assume, based on what Jews believe today, that there's no way that they believe that there's possibility of a Messiah that could actually be Yahweh himself. Would it interest you to find and learn that we know for a fact this was an actual debate in the first century. We have rabbis that actually see the scriptures that we went through last week and this week, and they saw the problems in the text as well. They saw the fact that the angel of the Lord is talking, and all of a sudden, the angel of the Lord is now called God. But God says, I'm going to send the angel of the Lord. So is he schizophrenic? What's the problem? What's going on? The true seekers of the faith and the ones that studied the text knew we've got a problem on our hands because we can't rectify the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. With the fact that we're finding more than one that's calling shots. You can't get away from it in the text. It's everywhere. We spent an hour and some odd minutes going through them last week. There was a book. If you want to go into deep, I put this on there. It's called The Two Powers in Heaven by Alan Segal. This is a Jewish person who wrote this book as his doctrinal thesis. Won multiple awards for this book because he dug deep into first century and pre-first century Jewish beliefs from understanding the Talmud and the Mishnah, the, the writings, the oral uh, traditions and law of, and history of the Jews that were written down in the Mishnah. And, the, and he saw some of these things in debates in the Mishnah and said, where are they getting this from and why aren't we taught this in rabbi school? And so he dug deep into extra curricular books and dug deeper into some of the texts and discovered that this was a huge debate in the first century. This was not across the board monotheism of the first century. Jews only believe in one God and there cannot be any other plurality of that one God. There were some rabbis that said, I got a problem with this verse, Rabbi B. You explain it to me. And Rabbi B said, it cannot happen. Cannot happen. And Rabbi A would say, but it has to happen because the text says it. Explain it. I cannot explain it and therefore it cannot happen. And aren't we like that today? We cannot explain it, so therefore it cannot happen. We're just as as prideful and arrogant as they were. And so we're going to go through some of this. Early rabbinical writings, non-believers in Yeshua, mind you, really important that you know this. This is a, a, a conversation. He says, And meddle not with them that are given to change. Proverbs 24, 21. Do not meddle with those who declare that there is a second God. So there is a sect of Judaism that believe that there's a second God because this conversation is happening. Rabbi Judah, son of Shimon, Simon said, Scripture says, and it shall come to pass that in all the land, says the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die. He's referencing uh, Zechariah 13.8. The mouths that declare that there are two powers shall be cut off and die. So what's happening? 
the conversation is being written from the perspective of the guy that disagrees. So there was a debate in the first century that there were two powers in heaven, is how it was, re- it was worded. And this particular rabbi says, if you, believe, if you believe in those that believe in the two powers of heaven, you're going to be cut off and die. So th- what am I trying to say? Either side, doesn't matter. I'm proving textually that there was a debate. You follow me? That's all I'm saying. So for those that say that Jews would never, ever, ever even come up with a concept, those are your Christians that come from paganism, you don't know your history. Do your homework and you will discover that this was very much a very strong debate as you're going to see. Pre-existent Messiah, some and most uh, believers that come uh, from their denominational backgrounds will say that the Messiah never pre-existed. He existed only when he was created in earth realm. Are you sure? Have you done your homework? At that hour, this is from the book of Enoch. I'm not saying the book of Enoch is Scripture. What I am proving in this this, uh, teaching or message is that the debate and the concept was there. It was already in their minds. The book of Enoch, it says, At that hour, the Son of Man was given a name in the presence of the Lord of the spirits, before the beginning of days, even before the creation of the sun and the moon, before the creation of the stars, he was given a name in the presence of the Lord of the spirits. He'll become a staff for the righteous. This is incredible, I think. This is long before the New Testament, guys. This is what your disciples were reading. He will will become a staff for the righteous ones in order that they may lean on him and not fall. He is the light of the Gentiles and will become the hope of those who are sick in their hearts. Are you kidding me? Light of the Gentiles? All those who dwell upon the earth shall fall and worship before him. They shall glorify, bless, and sing the name of the Lord of the spirits. Enoch has never met Yeshua. For the purpose he became the chosen one. He was concealed in the presence of the Lord of the spirits prior to the creation of the world and for eternity. He has revealed the wisdom of the Lord of the spirits to the righteous and the holy ones. For he has preserved the portion of the righteous because they have hated and despised the world of oppression. Together with all his ways of life and habits and his good pleasure that he have me. For they, the wicked kings and landowners, have denied the Lord of the spirits and his Messiah. So Enoch has, the writer of the book of Enoch, has the concept in his mind that the Messiah existed and was given his name before the creation of the world and his role was laid out for him. He was chosen to be the light to the Gentiles and the staff, the scepter of the Lord God to those that are righteous, that they could lean on Him. Is that not the most beautiful description of our King? It is to me. And again, the point is to say not to validate the book of Enoch. It's to validate the fact that literarily it exists, the concept that the Messiah in Judaism preexisted. Let's continue. The Son of Man actually judges all, and there was great joy amongst them, and they blessed, glorified, extolled, because the name of the Son of Man had been revealed unto them, and he that sat on the throne of his glory. Does that sound familiar? Can you see where the disciples and some of the writers got their terminology? These are books that they read. And the sum of judgment was given unto the Son of Man. And he caused the sinners to pass away and be destroyed from the face of the earth. And those that have have led the world astray with chains, they shall be bound. And on their assemblage piece of destruction, they shall be imprisoned. And on their works vanish from the face of the earth. And from the henceforth, they shall be nothing corruptible. Listen, for that the Son of Man has appeared and has seated himself on the throne of his glory. And all evil shall pass away before his face. And the word of that Son of Man shall go forth and be strong before the Lord of spirits. 
And so in Judaism, there was a concept that was developed that, that there were multiple thrones in heaven. And we have Yeshua, the Messiah, the, 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 the Son of glory, sitting on this throne and giving power to judge all mankind. And so it was already understood in Judaism at the time that the Messiah was going to judge all mankind. The thought was there. Does the Messiah actually sit on Yahweh's throne? In those days, the elect one shall sit on my throne. And from the conscience of his mouth shall come out of the secrets of wisdom, for the Lord of the spirits has given them to him and glorified him. So the Messiah, according to Enoch, is going to sit on the throne of Yahweh. Did you know that if you ask any Jew today, who can sit on Yahweh's throne? They would say, absolutely no one. No one but the king can sit on the throne. No one in his place. The throne is reserved for the creator himself. That means that Enoch, at least Enoch, the writer of Enoch had it in his mind that the Messiah had the power, the authority that was identical and equal and shared the glory of Yahweh, the very glory that his own scripture said can't be shared. Where did he get this idea from? Did he make it up or was he there? Multiple thrones. Daniel 7, 9. Now let's get back into the scriptures and the prophets. Daniel 7, 9 says, I watched till thrones, the Hebrew it's plural as it is in the English, were put in place. Thrones? I thought there's only one God. I thought there's only one throne. And the Ancient of Days was seated. Wait a minute. Was he sitting on two thrones? I know he's a big guy. But maybe they should make the throne bigger. They don't have to make two thrones for him to sit on. There's no mention. I watched till the thrones were put in place. Watch carefully. We went through this for some of you that were paying attention. You should already be blown away. And the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. Remember this? A fiery stream issued and came from before his throne, and ten thousands issued to him. Who is this Ancient of Days? Ancient of Days, Revelation, gives the exact same description when John sees Yeshua. His eyes are a flame of fire. His, white, his hair was white in, as wool and his, and his hair as snow. The same exact definition given to the Ancient of Days. So how many are ancient? Because Yeshua is given the exact same physical appearance description as the Ancient of Days that's sitting on the throne. Z. Now you may say one person can only sit on a throne, but that is only from your perspective because you live in a three-dimensional world. Now, if we lived in a three-dimensional world, which we do, and I'm sitting on a chair, and I want my wife to sit on my lap, you can visualize that. The two people could actually sit on a throne, but she's not technically sitting on the throne because she's not touching the throne. Do you follow me? But what if we're not in a three-dimensional world, we're in a higher form of reality, because after all, wheels of fire don't really fit on a throne in our dimension. We don't even understand. What is that for a quick getaway? We don't know. But in a different and a higher dimension, is it possible for the Ancient of Days and the Lord of Hosts to actually sit on the same throne? Maybe. We don't know the answer to that because we're not in that dimension. But I want you to ponder the question of is it possible that something can happen outside of our understanding and just because we don't understand it that it can't happen. What did I say in the very beginning? This is what we do. I do not understand it, therefore do not exist. Is this not what atheists do today? We do not understand how the universe could be created in an instant, therefore it could not have been created in an instant. I submit to you that Christians are no different. We are Greco-Roman American scientists at heart that we say we don't understand it, therefore it cannot happen. And I say that you are telling the God of the living universe who has the universe in His hand. In a, in a dimension that you can't understand. How many dimensions do you think there are? We don't even know. But scientists have calculated that if, a big if according to them, if Genesis is true, just at creation, 
there was 10 dimensions. Just at creation, there had to be 10 dimensions at least just to create the universe. We only understand three. Four, if you count the fourth dimension model, even though they say it may not exist, they actually can calculate by video, by computer and mathematics, a fourth dimension. It's a square, a cube, that actually folds in and outside of itself, of the, of the time-space continuum. They know that, that you can, it's possible, maybe, but it would take faith to believe it exists. You and I are women and men of faith, so we believe that there's higher dimensions, do we not? So if there is is higher dimensions, there's higher rules. So quit putting God on your rules of your little bitty three-dimensional world. He's a big guy. He plays by his rules. You're only operating in in the rule book, the rule bank that he gave you. Does that make a little bit of sense? Next week, I hope to go into science of this. I really want to unpack that. This is just a teaser because I want to go into proving God by science, the nature of God through science. Wouldn't that be interesting? I'm going to show you how we can really truly understand, I believe, or at least get a glimpse. Can't understand it. But if we just get a glimpse, it would be more amazing. After all, the more that you understand the nature of God, the more you understand your nature. You know why? Because you're made in His image. If you don't understand his nature to some degree, you don't understand your own nature to some degree, and that causes you to be off a degree. And that's a problem. Look at this. How many know who Rabbi Akiva is? First century rabbi, a contemporary of Gamaliel, the most famous rabbi in the first century. Every Jewish person on the planet knows who Rabbi Akiva is. He's quoted all the time. Ask them how many of you realize that he believed that the Messiah was preexistent and divine. Here's, his, here's the quote from the Babylonian Talmud, Sanhedrin 38b, for those of you that are keeping track of me. One throne was for himself and one for David, the, the Messiah, which meant divinity. Okay, it wasn't for, it's an idiomatic expression, didn't mean it was for David exactly, himself. Even as it has been taught, one was for himself and one for David. This is Rabbi Akiva's view, and the conversation goes on, and they rebuke Rabbi Akiva. You don't really do that. He's the most honored rabbi. But in this dialogue, they rebuke Rabbi Akiva because he believed that the Messiah was divine and preexistent, and sat on a throne right next to the Most High God. Do you know why he believed that? Because he was the most honored rabbi, which means he read the Bible more. The more you read the front of the book, the more it's all over the place. The concept of two powers in heaven, you cannot get away from it. You have to literally be an ostrich putting your head in the sand, or a person that says, I do not believe it, so therefore it is not true. It's my new accent. Get used to it. <laughs> it's a little Russian, I think, actually. I'm hanging around the Russians too much. But it's very true. You have to be intellectually biased to not see it because it's absolutely everywhere. And it was in the concept of the first century Jew. We're going to continue to see clearly the New Testament authors were very familiar with the Jewish apocalyptic ideas of the divine Messiah that Enoch talks about. How do we know that? How do I know? I made a statement earlier that the disciples read the book of Enoch. Prove it, Jim. Here we go. Book of Jude, verse 14. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also. How did he prophesy? In his book that they read saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of His saints to execute judgment. We just read that passage on all. To convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which the ungodly sinners have spoken against Him. Do you see the significance of this passage? The significant. this is why the book of Enoch, there was a major debate on whether to canonize it. Because the disciples were quoting from it multiple times. This is not the first time. 
The disciples are quoting from the book of Enoch as an authoritative literary source. If that's the case, then that means that it formed or was a part of forming their theology. Do you follow me? Their reading is forming their theology no different than our reading is forming our theology. Enoch was one of the commentators that they read. And their apocalyptic ideas of the Messiah was directly influenced by Enoch's book itself. The book of Enoch, if you go through it, teaches this. It teaches the messianic son of man is the judge of all creation. Sits on Yahweh's throne, which according to the rabbis would make him God. And according to the scriptures himself, actually. Is preexistent before all creation and was with God in his presence for all eternity past. This is what it says. This is what the Jewish people are reading in the first century, which is why there's a debate is the hope of the Gentiles in all creation will worship Him. Ladies and gentlemen, this is pretty heavy stuff. King of glory. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 8 says, The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. Who are we talking about? At this point, you really think it's a trick question. I understand. But 1 Corinthians, we're in the New Testament, that's a clue. Who are we talking about? Yeshua himself, right? Very good. I know one of you answered online. So Yeshua himself is the Lord of glory. So they crucify the Lord of glory. Who is the Lord of glory? Psalms 24, 7 says, Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? Yahweh, strong and mighty, the Yahweh, mighty in battle. How do you, wait a minute, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yahweh, time out, don't look at this, turn it off, take that slide off there. If you know your Bible and you were with me in our last part, series of this, we discovered who is actually leading the army. Remember? It said the angel of the Lord was leading. It was called Yahweh Sevaot, Yahweh of hosts. What does that mean? Yahweh of the host of heaven. What does that mean? Yahweh of the army of heaven. So the angel of the Lord was the one that's leading the army of the Lord. So now we can go back to our slide because we got a problem because it says, who is this king of glory? Yahweh, strong and mighty. Yahweh is the one that's mighty in battle. Lifting up your heads, lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory, ancient of days, ancient of doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? Yahweh Sevaot, the Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. And they crucified the Lord of glory. From a linguistic perspective, we have a giant problem if we do not believe that Yahweh manifests Himself in the form of man as Yeshua because right here, Paul, a head rabbi who knew the front of the book better than all of us combined times ten, says that it was Yeshua was the King of glory. And when you go to Psalm 27, do you, Psalm 24, do you believe that Paul was not quoting the Scripture? He knows who the King of glory is. It is King Yeshua, Yahweh, Sevaot, and they crucified him. Do not believe that Paul is just throwing out phrases that he has no idea what they mean. That he just casually, as an academic professor and rabbi himself, just accidentally gives Yeshua the same title as the King of glory. Are you serious? No rabbi would ever make that mistake. Messiah is not the king of glory, the one who sits on the throne, Yahweh, leading the host of heaven. Paul knew exactly what he was doing and used his phrases very carefully, which is why he was difficult to understand. Because he's pulling, because most people didn't even then, didn't then know the front of the book like he did. John 3.31, listen to this. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth. 
and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. Psalm 97.9 says, For you, Adonai, the Most High above all the earth, you are exalted far above all Elohim. Do you think John, who some say is the most Jewish of all the apostles, does not know the book of Psalms? Does not know that, that, that says that Adonai, it's Yahweh that is above all the earth. And he says that he who comes from heaven is above all the earth. Which one is it? Are these Jewish apostles apostates? Or do they have theology that we have forgotten and don't realize how true it is? But we can't understand it, so it can't be true. Isaiah 44, 6 says, Thus says Adonai, King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and the last. Beside me there is no God. Let's break this down. Thus says the Lord, King of Israel, Yahweh Himself, and His Redeemer, Yahweh Sevaot. This is a problem, ladies and gentlemen. We got two Yahwehs in one verse. Which one is which? We got the Yahweh King of Israel and the Yahweh Lord of hosts. How do we know it's Lord of hosts? Because it's already said Yahweh Sevaot 110 times in the Tanakh itself. We know it's Yahweh. But it says the King of Israel, Adonai. Who's the king of Israel? We know this is Yeshua. Nobody on earth that's a believer in Yeshua would say that the king of Israel is not Yeshua. But the king of Israel is Yeshua, Adonai. It calls him Adonai right here. And the Redeemer. Nobody would say that Yeshua is not the Redeemer. Yet there are people that believe in Torah and people that believe in the Scriptures that call upon Yeshua and say that he's the Redeemer, but he cannot be Yahweh. And I say, you don't know your Bible. You don't know your history. And just because you don't understand it doesn't mean it's not true. You may not understand string theory. You may not understand physics. You may not understand the universe. You may not understand how the universe was created, Mr. Christian. But you believe that? Why are you picking and choosing? Because you are favorable to the Jewish theology? You're picking their theology, and they don't even believe in the Messiah, yet because they don't believe today that there's two powers in heaven, you say you're going to side with them. And I call you a Judaizer. That is the definition. When you take a Jewish theology and you make it Scripture just because it's Jewish, ladies and gentlemen, why don't you just take your hat off Cut your head open. Check your brains in at the door. I don't mean to be harsh, but ladies and gentlemen, theology is important. We're talking about the nature of our God here. We don't just pick and choose scriptures and say, this can't happen because I don't understand it. Or this can't happen because I used to believe that in, in Christianity in my denomination. Oh, because the Baptists believe this, it can't be true. How arrogant have we become to say that just because a people group believes something that you've never studied on your own, that it can't be true. My Bible makes it abundantly clear in a court of law, hands down it wins. The Lord, the King of Israel, who is called Yahweh in other scriptures, and the Redeemer is called Yahweh of hosts. We've got two, Yahweh of Israel and Yahweh the Redeemer. I am the first and the last. Which one's the first and the last? The rabbis had this question, which one's the first and the last? Or is one the first and one the last? Besides me, there is no Elohim. There is no God. Which one? There's two. Then we have an interesting verse in the Brit Adashah in Revelation when it says in 117, And when I saw him, Yeshua, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Chapter 5, they worship but one who lives forevermore. It's quoting this. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. Time out. Isaiah says it's Yahweh 
is the first and the last. The Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Yet Yeshua, the Messiah, is told that He is the first and the last. How can they both be the first and the last? Unless Yeshua was there before the creation of the world as the Word, Memra of God. Inside Yahweh, is Yahweh, comes out of Yahweh, cloaks Himself in humanity, and says, I is the man you've been talking and reading about. Follow what I say. And the Christians say, well, Yeshua didn't quote the Sabbath in the New Testament, so therefore we won't do it. But they'll believe that Jesus is God, and I submit to you that if you believe that Jesus is God, Mr. or Mrs. Christian, then He wrote all of the commandments. So when Jesus on earth says, you should do what I say, if you believe, that He is Elohim of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you better write down and believe and do everything He said. Don't tell me, Mr. and Mrs. Christian, that you believe that Jesus is God and say that, well, He didn't say this. He didn't have to. He already did. And He wrote it down. And He was there with Abraham in the tent. He was there when He went with him to Sodom. He was there with Joshua showed up in the burning bush. He was there and he walked in the garden as the memory of the Word of God. He was there when his arm stretched out. He was there because the Word of God is the arm of God in the earth realm in our dimension. The rock. I'll try to finish up here shortly. I know I'm going long. I apologize. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Shimon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Catholics use this scripture. He's saying, Peter, Kephas, which means rock, little rock, you, little rock, I'm going to build the rock upon this rock. I'm going to build my ecclesia, my assembly. That's what he's saying. But here's what I want to pull out. He's calling Yeshua, says he's the rock. Isaiah 44, 8 says, Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I am the rock, called the rock of ages. And Yeshua uses that exact title. So we got a problem. Either Yeshua is Yahweh, or he is in big trouble when he dies on the cross. And stand before God, and God said, Look, you're the rock. Oh, this is a good one. According to Christians, this is the pivotal verse that people use to prove that Yeshua is Yahweh. So let's walk through this and find out because this is a massive debate, and I think it's a piece of cake, personally. Psalm 110 1 says, The Yahweh, the Lord, said to my Lord, which is Adoni, which means my Lord. Adon is Lord. When you add the I on it, it means my. So it's my Lord. Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So Yahweh says unto Adoni, sit at my right hand till you make your enemies your footstool. And people will say, well, let's just go through it. The Masoretic text, which is a thousand years later after Yeshua, clearly shows that the second Lord is pronounced Adoni instead of Adonai. So those that debate... So if you have a Jew and a Trinitarian Christian, let's say, and I've watched these on YouTube, they're debating. This is the verse they debate over. The rabbi will say, the Masoretic text clearly pronounces Adoni. And Adoni means my Lord. It does not ever mean my God or Adonai. Adonai, this says the rabbi. If it's Adonai, it would mean God. Always would be the supreme deity. But because it's pronounced in the Masoretic text Adoni, you are clearly wrong, Mr. Mrs. Trinitarian. So the argument goes. But Mr. Rabbi, I would like to point out, and I don't understand why Christians that are debating uh, people like this do not point this out. This is such an easy argument. Here's the problem with that logic. There's no vowel pointings in the original language. The Masoretic text is a thousand years later, and the rabbis added the vowel pointings after they knew that there's a sect in, Christ, in Judaism called the Way, the Christians, that believed that Yeshua was the one that they debated about, the divine Messiah. 
they can't have the text saying, Yahweh said unto the Lord God. So they added a vowel pointing that changed it from Adonai. Because would it interest you to discover that the word Adoni and the word Adonai are the same exact word in Hebrew. The only difference is a dot of vowel pointing. Just the vowel pointing changes how you pronounce it. So the text breaks down completely. Adoni is found in reference to God in more than one place. Even if it was Adoni. The debate is, it can never, it's never. I saw this on YouTube. The rabbi said, it's never ever used according to God. It's never referenced toward God. Hey, that's two in one day. I'm impressed. But it is. I found it. In more than one place, Adoni is actually referencing God itself. And we don't have time to go in it, but it is there. On more than one occasion, Yahweh himself is, uh, is used, Adoni is used in referring to God. So it is possible. Either way, it doesn't really matter. Why? Because in verse 5, it says this, only four verses later, the Lord, and that one is Adonai in the Masoretic text, is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. Ladies and gentlemen, if you know your Bible, who is afforded all judgment in the earth? Yeshua himself. And what's it say? Adonai is at your right hand. What is every mess, uh, messianic scripture prophecy, all the way from Genesis to Revelation, say is sitting at the right hand of God? Is the Messiah. It is the Messiah that sits at the right hand that executes the judgment. And right here in verse 5, it says, it's Adonai. Adonai is at your right hand. Can't be the big guy. He's on the left hand. Adonai is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of judgment. And yes, I do understand it's an idiomatic expression of power. Adonai is the power of the Most High God. That doesn't make sense either. Unless there is two powers in heaven, and they are one. Do I understand it? No. Do I understand calculus? I stopped before calculus. Trigonom trigonometry, I understood. Geom geometry, I understood. Algebra, I understood. Calculus, I didn't see the point. Psalms 110.1, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Ladies and gentlemen, the Adoni of verse 1 is Adonai of verse 5. How did they not see that? I do not know. We're almost done. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of judgment. And John 5 says, For the Father judges no one. Committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son, so the Son must be Adonai. Do you see the progressive logic? It's easy to see. It's undeniable. Adonai is the one that judges. Watch this. Judges 6.11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which is in uh, Ophrah, and belonged to Joash the Abizrite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, O oh, my Adon, if my Lord, okay now, just a human. If the Lord is with us, if Yahweh is with us, then why has all this happened to us? Then Yahweh turned to him. So the angel is speaking, and Yahweh turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the, head, uh, from the hands of the Midianites. And have I not sent you? And Yahweh said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Now Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. Who? The one talking. Yahweh. Do you see this? It's everywhere. You can't get away from it. It's like Visa. It's everywhere you want to be. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall you defeat the Midianites. And he said, I, I, I now perceive that he's the angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And lived is what he means to say. That's why the Lord, Adonai, said to him, Peace be to you, you will not die. You saw the angel's face. He's talking to the angel. We know that. He's literally talking to a human being. How do we know that? Because he calls him Adon. He thinks that he's a human. He's looking at the face of the angel. 
And then all of a sudden he realizes it's Yahweh. Adonai speaks to him. Here's an important point that I made over and over. The angel of the Lord came to Gideon as a human being. And it wasn't the first time. It's all through the Scriptures. There is a theophany. There is a, a, uh, the Creator shows up. Yahweh shows up in a human form with real hands, real arms, real legs. Even eats, dines. Three dine with Abraham. The Word has human attributes. Jeremiah 1.4, Then the Word of the Lord came to me, saying, So the Word of the Lord comes and speaks. Then the Lord put forth His hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, of human attributes. Was it a real hand, a fake hand, or was it an imaginary hand? But there was a real hand that touched his real mouth. Again, Isaiah 42, 8, in case you don't believe me, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Yet John 71 says, Yeshua spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come, glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. How do we not see this? How did I not see this? In conclusion, the Tanakh, the Old Testament, definitely teaches and supports the concept of a plurality within the Godhead. We don't have to understand it. It's textually sound. The second Yahweh appears at times in human form. It's textually factual. The disciples of Jesus Yeshua were familiar with the concept of the Memra, or the Word of Yahweh, being divine, as many Jews of that day believed in the concept of two Yahwehs being one without violating the Shema. And the plurality of the Godhead, listen, did not originate in paganism. Don't believe everything you read in Google. Don't believe everything that you, that you read in these Hebrew Roots blogs that think they're smarter than God Himself because they find a trinity or a plurality of a Godhead in paganism. Of course you're going to find a plurality in paganism. Where do you think they got the idea from? Who was first, the chicken or the egg? Yahweh Himself was, is, was first. Hasatan takes what is good and twists it. Name a theology and occultism that you can't find in the Bible. I can find it in the Bible. How do I know? I just take the reverse of their theology and I'll find it. Yahweh is, is truth. Hasatan is nothing. He steals the truth and tricks us by twisting it. So, of course, there is a plurality in paganism, but this predates the paganism. Because the debate goes all the way back as far as we can find is past 150 B.C. that this debate was happening. And there are some scholars that believe it went way past that. We just don't have any record of it. If it's 150 B.C., it's all the way back to the Septuagint. 250 B.C. of the Dead Sea Scrolls and Qumran. All this to say this. For those that do not believe that it is possible for Yeshua to be Yahweh, you have a very, very steep road ahead of you to prove that because there are Jews in the first century that believed that and they ended up being called the disciples. They penned these words. You can't have Yeshua saying, glorify me with the glory that you had, that I had with you before the creation of the world, if he didn't exist before the creation of the world and share the glory that the Bible says God doesn't share. And he doesn't, except with himself. You don't have to understand how I can take a cluster of grapes that's made up of a hundred grapes and call it a chad and say it's one. You say, no, it's not. Oh, yes. In Hebrew, it's one. It's many grapes, but it's one cluster. They're unified. It's a chad. I can tell you right now, you already have this concept if you're married. The Bible says that you are one. You are a chad with your spouse. But you're two. 
How many of us have even taught this? That from God's perspective, He sees how many? One. Why do you think He made Adam and Eve together first? He's teaching the concept of the Godhead. When did He say, I make man in our image? Adam and Eve are inside one another. One. Was Eve not there or was she? Eve was definitely there. Why? Because the Scriptures say He pulled her out. So in a different world, in a different creation before the fall, even before the creation, the separation of Eve, there's a gorgeous, beautiful pattern of what God is like. He is like two beings in one. That at some point in the future would separate. And be clearly two that would once again come back and be one. So tonight, in this part of this series, the game and the goal was to show you persuasively the Scriptures how big your God really is. That there really is a plurality within Him. That you can't figure him out with your Greco-Roman mindset to say God is this and God cannot be this. That is like a worm saying that there cannot be a bird. Because he's never seen one. Because he lives underground. And he cannot see up. But oh boy does he know it when he's judged. The bird swipes down and eats them alive. In the same way, those that do not believe that there is a plurality within the nature of the Most High God will one day see that plurality when He shows up on the clouds, but they might just be swallowed. Because the nature of God is that important that we understand, at least give open credence to what the Scriptures have to say. So in this, in conclusion, this week, I want you to see that the idea is not only there, it's real. Not only is it real, it's amazing. It's amazing. It defies the laws of our physics, and I like that. Because any God that can fit into my understanding and the laws of physics is no God that I want to serve. He's a God the same size as me, and that's not very big. But a God that defies the laws of physics, where two can sit on one and two can act as one and be in two places at one time and be the same under the same thought process, mind, control, and will, is a God that I can't understand and therefore I say I don't understand it, I shema. So hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. But it doesn't have to be from your perspective. Because he defines one his way. Yeshua's last breath, one of his last prayers ever was what? Father, make them one. Was he saying make them God? No. He's showing his heart of what the nature of God is. It is echad. It is unity. This is why Mishpachah in this congregation, it is so critical why so critical that we have unity. That love is the pinnacle of our life. Because theology means nothing. The nature of God is nothing if it is not bannered, based, soaked in love. That's why it's a bigger God that you serve if you believe that Yeshua is one with the Father in nature and essence because then you've got the creator of the universe giving himself to die for his creation. It's way bigger than some really good guy. It is my King and my Lord. It is the one who created me that 
is impossible to see the breadth of even his creation that chose to step out of his divinity. Take on and cloak himself, it says. In the likeness of God, in the equality of God, of that which we cannot understand, it says. And I believe they wrote it exactly the way they believed it. And it was that God that we serve that died for us and rose again. And he ascended back to his rightful throne and sits at the right hand power of the most guy God that he came from within. Please stand with me.